Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. The study of Ezekiel's temple is one of the most exciting topics in the entire Bible because as we begin to understand what these chapters are saying, and when we understand that there are people trying to build this temple right now, you begin to realize that the temple might be built in our lifetime. And so welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. Today we're finishing up our study of the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be looking at the temple that Ezekiel describes in chapters 40 to 48. Now, I've been privileged to be a part of a couple of church construction projects, and and I've seen some architectural designs where there's just thick rolls of of designs, all kinds of pages, all kinds of sheets dedicated to all kinds of things. You'll have entire pages dedicated just to the shape and size of curbs or or where the electrical boxes are located or, or how the light spills into the parking lot. And so when you look at these architectural plans and you're trying to show them to somebody else, you tend not to get bogged down in the details unless they needed to know them. But if you're just explaining what you're looking at, you say things like, uh, hey, here's the nursery and it's got a sink and a counter space and a bathroom off to the side. You explain it like that. You don't say, here's the nursery. It's 14 by 16 foot with a 25 and a half inch counter depth and a 16 inch sink. I mean, you could say those things, but you usually don't. And so, although these chapters in Ezekiel have a ton of construction-like details, I want to just try to explain these chapters in a more of a high-level overview, and and I hope that this time together will help you see the beauty and the wonder of the temple, which is going to be built one day in Israel. And so, if you have a Bible handy, let's start with a quick review of chapter 40, and then we're going to go on to chapter 41. Yesterday, we gave an overview of the temple complex. It's going to be a large, walled complex that will be 875 feet by 875 feet wide and long. There will be a wall around it that's 10 and a half feet tall. If you were going to the temple complex, you would have gone through a gate, either the northern gate or the southern gate. These gates would have been huge. They'd be 105 feet tall, 43 feet wide. They'd be buildings that would contain gates within them through which you would pass. Once you went through the gate, you would then come to a large open court. Within that large court is a smaller inner court that was also surrounded by a wall with gates that were the same size and design as the gates that you just went through. And so then you'd walk 175 feet through the open court to the next set of gates. You'd go through them and then you'd climb up 10 stairs to a wide porch in front of the temple. Okay, so now that was a review of chapter 40. Now let's go on to chapter 41. If you have your Bibles open in verses 1 and 2, you've got a porch here, and this porch is going to be 19 feet wide, and and at the top of it are two giant pillars, and and each of these pillars, they're huge. They're 10 feet wide each. Now, if you're going to the temple, you're going to walk through these pillars to two beautiful doors, and they have cherubim and palm trees carved into them. And then you go through them, through that doorway there, into a long room that's 70 feet long by 35 feet wide. Now, the NAS calls this room the nave. The NIV calls this the outer sanctuary. Now, if you remember the tabernacle, this first area was called the holy place. And and there was also a second place called the holy of holies. But here, it's not either. It's just an open sanctuary area. Now, if you were standing in this sanctuary and and looked around, you would see that the walls have carved into them beautiful images of cherubs and, and palm trees. Again, there is still the second room, though. And Ezekiel can see into it through the doorway, which he says in verse 3, that doorway is 7 cubits wide or a little over 12 feet wide. But he's looking in. And in the holy place, Ezekiel's not going to go there. And so in verses 3 and 4, the bronze angel guide goes into the most holy place and he calls out the measurements, which are 20 cubits by 20 cubits or 35 feet by 35 feet. In other words, a cube. And we should note that the only cubes that are mentioned in the Bible are the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies in the temple, the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, 16, and now here in Ezekiel's temple. And so this place, this place of God's design, it's this perfect cube. Now, going back to Ezekiel 41, as for what's inside this room, down in verse 18, there's a mention of a small wooden altar. The bronze angel calls it the table that is before the Lord. Now, we know that this is not the main altar for sacrifices. That's explained in chapter 43. So, more than likely, this is the altar of incense. So, that's the temple. It's a beautiful, serene building dedicated to the worship of the Lord. Now, we might be tempted to stop here and just bask in all that this might mean. But the thing is, Ezekiel doesn't stop there. We're only a few verses into chapter 41. And so, in verses 5 to 11, Ezekiel suddenly turns his gaze outside the temple and discusses a thick wall that went around the temple. 
There's also staircases leading to various side rooms. Then, in verses 12 to 26, Ezekiel also describes separate buildings around the outside of the temple. Now, there's a lot of details here that we'll skim over just to say that there were various chambers for various reasons. Likewise, in chapter 42, Ezekiel describes two more structures alongside the temple. And in chapter 42, verse 6, it says that these were for priestly chambers. Also, in chapter 42, verses 13 and 14, it lets us know that other ones were for dining halls and storage rooms for the priests. In fact, although we're going quickly here, chapter 42 also tells us that there are various other rooms throughout the complex. These other rooms are found along the north, south, and west walls. Not the east wall, but the north, south, and west walls. And along these walls were 30 chambers, so 90 chambers in total. And verses 13 and 14 mention that they're for eating and changing and probably other kinds of things. I mean, after all, there are 90 of them. And so we've got this temple with lots of room for staff and storage and supplies. And now let's go on to chapter 43, because this is where the main event happens. Chapter 43 contains one of the key points of these final chapters. And in the opening verses of chapter 43, the glory of the Lord finally returns to his temple and the Lord fills it. Ezekiel 43 verses 4 and 5 say, And the glory of the Lord came into the temple through the east gate. Then the Spirit took me up into the inner courtyard and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now this is huge because we saw back in chapters 10 and 11 that the glory of the Lord left the people. And ever since then, God's glory has not been in Jerusalem or among the people. In fact, the glory of the Lord has not ever returned ever since. But here in chapter 43, we are prophetically looking to the day when the glory of the Lord does come back to his people. In other words, God's glory won't return until the millennial temple is constructed according to God's divine plan. Going on to verse 7. In verse 7, the Lord tells Ezekiel that this is where he will rule from. And that means that one day, Jerusalem will be the capital of the entire world. Now, the Lord also tells Ezekiel in verse 7 that the priests will no longer sinfully engage in idolatry, but they will worship him instead in holiness, and he will live among them forever. Now, when you think about when this will happen, this has to be referring to a future age when mankind will not go astray. And many Bible students would say that this can only happen in the millennium when the world is finally on board with obeying God. And so this future temple here will serve as the throne room of the Lord, and he will dwell among his people there. In fact, the very last book of the entire book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 48, 35, it says that the city where this temple will reside shall be called Yahweh Shammah, meaning the Lord is there. And so verses 1 and 9 here, they're super important, but so are verses 10 and 11. Now, we mentioned these verses in yesterday's podcast. In verses 10 and 11, the Lord tells Ezekiel to bring this instruction about the temple to the people of Israel. And if the people repent, then he's to show them the design of this temple, including all of its details. And notice what verse 11 says. It's specifically so that they may, it says, observe the whole design and all its statutes and do them. Now, we mentioned this yesterday. All of these details aren't some symbolic description of the temple. These are specific plans for the people to follow. God doesn't intend for these passages to be obeyed figuratively, and, and neither should we. So chapter 43 is super important, but it's also important for other reasons as well. For instance, it talks about the altar in verses 13 to 17, and then how to consecrate the altar in verses 18 to 27. This altar is going to be outside, in front of the temple. It's going to be huge. And we're going to be talking about the sacrifices offered there in a few minutes. I'd also like to point out in chapter 43, verse 19, that there's a reference to the offspring of Zadok. Now, this is not a small detail. It's actually the second of four references to the offspring of Zadok in these passages here. Now, the man Zadok lived during the days of David. And in 1 Kings 1.8, he was the only priest who maintained faithfulness to David for his entire life. Likewise, in 2 Samuel 18, verse 27, it was the son of Zadok who ran to David to give him news of a battle. And so Zadok was faithful, and apparently his offspring were faithful too. And, and you'll remember from our studies in the prophets that God laid much of the blame for the nation's apostasy at the feet of the priests. The priests, of course, were the descendants of Levi. And so it looks like the line of Zadok did not go astray. And so in the revived temple, although the Levites will still be priests, the authority will rest with the priests who were the descendants of Zadok. And if you keep this in mind as you read through the rest of the Bible, you'll be surprised how often Zadok's name comes up. Okay, now let's go on to chapter 44. Chapter 44. 
Chapter 44 dovetails with what we looked at a few days ago in Ezekiel 37, where the Lord will bring his people back to life and rejoin the people of Israel together, and they would have their own land, and God would dwell in their midst, and they would worship him forever. And so the last few chapters have begun to show us what this will look like. And chapter 44 helps us understand the role of the prince among his people. So who is the prince that's talked about in chapter 44? Well, as much as we would want this to be Jesus, it's it's not. Too much of what this prince does is inconsistent with the Messiah. And so we're not sure who the prince is, but he's very important in these days. He he does a lot. Here in verse 3, he is the one who's able to open the eastern gate. In chapter 45, verse 7, he'll have land. In chapter 45, 17, he'll provide the offerings for the people. And throughout chapter 46, the prince offers sacrifices. And in verse 10, the prince will assemble among his people. And so the prince is super important in this whole future event. And one day we'll find out who he is. And we don't have time to keep on waiting around trying to figure that out. So let's now go on to chapter 45. Chapter 45 continues this discussion of the temple, but now the focus is on where it's to be put. Now, without getting bogged down in the details, there's a lot of debate about where this temple should be placed. But nearly everyone I came across recognizes that it should be placed somewhere on the Temple Mount, pretty much where the Dome of the Rock now stands. Now, there are other people who have their ideas, and and for good reason. And so, no matter what, Jeremiah 3.17 says that Jerusalem is called the throne of the Lord, And so wherever this temple is going to be built, wherever chapter 45 is intending for it to go, it will be located within the city of Jerusalem. Okay, now skimming along to chapter 46. Chapter 46 is helpful because in verses 19 to 24, we learn that each corner of the temple has small courtyards that house kitchens, and these kitchens are for the preparations of the sacrifices for the people to eat. Now, you might remember that in certain kinds of offerings, like peace offerings, the worshiper would present a sacrifice to the Lord and then go and eat it together with his family, the priests, and things like that. It was a beautiful picture of fellowship with God in in one another. And so in this temple here, God's people will once again enjoy peace with him and one another. Now, going on to chapter 47, and and I know we're going quick, and I kind of apologize, but we got to get through this material. Chapter 47 tells us an important feature that we might overlook. And this is that there is a river flowing from the temple going east to the Jordan River. Although there's no river there now, when the Lord returns, there's going to be a massive earthquake. And it's commonly believed that from that earthquake, a spring will then open on up and you'll have this river flowing from this place. And you see this, you see this earthquake mentioned in Zechariah 14.4, where it says that the Mount of Olives will be split in middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half the mountains will move towards the north and the other half will move towards the south. And so from that earthquake will come a river flowing from the temple of God. Now, going back to Ezekiel 47, in verses 7 and 12, this river will be flanked by trees, and these trees will be a source of abundant sustenance for the people of the kingdom. Likewise, these trees will provide medicinal healing for the people. Now, speaking of the people of the kingdom, in chapters 47 and 48, Ezekiel also discusses the allocation of the land for the 12 tribes, or we should say the reallocation of the land. And this section here helps us see that Ezekiel's vision is intended to discuss some future time because the land was already allocated for the tribes during Ezekiel's days. And even if it was occupied by Babylon, it wasn't that long ago and there are still residents living there. Yet in Ezekiel's vision, the land allocation was needed again. And the allocation is much different than that of Joshua. For one thing, it won't be determined by lot. Likewise, it won't be kind of like a globular layout based on geographical landmarks, but rather it's going to be linear with parallel borders, and and the allocation is going to form something like the layers of a cake, starting with the tribe of Dan at the top, then going all the way down to the tribe of Gad at the bottom. And within this land allocation, you see that the people will have peace and they'll dwell with each other in harmony. Now, one more thing to point out before we wrap up. The very last verse of this book here, in chapter 48, verse 35, Ezekiel summarizes all of this saying, The city shall be 18,000 cubits round about, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there, that Yahweh Shammah. God will dwell among his people in this place, and all of the world will stream to him. So that's our study on Ezekiel's temple. I know it was quick, and I know we covered a lot. If you want to know more about this temple, I highly recommend a book called Messiah's Coming Temple. 
It's by John Schmidt and Carl Laney. It's super helpful in working through all the nitty-gritty details of this great topic. Now, before we go, you might have a couple of questions like, when does this take place? Well, in a week and a half, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel 9, 27, it says that the Antichrist will make a covenant for one week and halfway through, he will put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings. A similar point is also made in Daniel 11:31 and 12, 11. And so that means that when the Antichrist arrives on the scene at the beginning of the tribulation, some kind of Jewish temple will be fully functional and operating. And so I believe a temple will be built before Christ returns, but it's also clear that the full expression of these prophecies about the temple can only exist in the Messianic age, in the millennium. For instance, Ezekiel 43, 7 says that the house of Israel will never defile the Lord's name again. Now, these may be great people, but that can only happen in the millennial age. Or that there's this tree that has leaves that will not wither and that provide healing for the nations. That seems to be talking about something in the future also. Or even in Micah 4, 2, it says that the Messiah will teach his people from the temple. And although this was partially fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, the context of Micah 4 shows us that this will be at the end of the ages when the nations stream to the house of the Lord, and, and that's obviously not happened yet. And so it sure seems like the Jewish people will eventually succeed in building a temple. But as I mentioned yesterday, they're currently looking to build a hybrid temple. And once that's made, it's pretty much only a matter of time before the Antichrist puts a stop to the sacrifices, and, and three and a half years later, the Lord returns either to rehab the existing temple or make a new one that matches Ezekiel's vision. Finally, another key question that people often ask about the temple is, how can there be sacrifices in this temple? Now, this question certainly poses some challenges, though the biggest challenges may not be self-evident. For one thing, many Jewish scholars have noted that Ezekiel's temple is missing key implements such as the bronze laver, the table of showbread, the candlestick, the veil, the ark. Those are all pretty important things under the Mosaic system of worship. And so when, when they ask, how can there be sacrifices in this temple, sometimes they're really meaning, well, how do we do these sacrifices? And under what form will we be doing them? Now, for us as New Covenant believers, we know from Hebrews 9 and 10 that Jesus' one sacrifice atoned for our sins. And yet, these passages here are clear that there are going to be sacrifices in this temple. So how? Well, I believe we can provide the following answers to this question. One, I think a Jewish temple will be built before Jesus returns. They plan to model it after this temple, so the Jews will offer actual sacrifices in a temple that fits this pattern. And that right there will fulfill much of this vision here. But two, when you think about the Old Testament sacrifices, they weren't actually effective in and of themselves. They were only effective because they look forward to the cross. In the same way, these sacrifices in this temple are memorial, but they'll be looking back to the cross. And third, although Hebrews 9 and 10 show us that there is no longer any sacrifice for sin because of Jesus' death on our behalf on the cross— in Acts 21, verse 26, Paul makes a vow offering and a sacrifice. Now, that sacrifice was okay because he wasn't seeking to atone for his sin. And so, in a similar way, it seems that it's possible to make sacrifices of worship as long as we understand that our access to the Lord is through Christ alone. And so, those are some possible answers. No matter what, one day the Lord will return and he's going to explain how all this works. So, as we wrap up our time in the book of Ezekiel, it's clear that the temple and the reign of Christ are the focal point of human history and all people will one day bow before him. Let's look forward to that day. And that wraps up Ezekiel. Now let's head on to Daniel, another tough book that will blow our minds. So thanks for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless. God bless.